Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're going to investigate a key concept in statistics, econometrics, and hypothesis testing, that is, how to adjust for multiple testing and the family-wise error rate when testing multiple hypotheses at the same time. You obviously can relate to the fact that when you test a particular hypothesis, you can extract a p-value that can be roughly interpreted as the probability that the result you're observing is due to random chance alone. And most commonly, you compare the p-values that you have obtained from a particular statistical test, and we can abstract from which particular test it is for our current example. You compare it to the conventional thresholds. For example, you can check whether a particular result is significant at 1%, whether it's significant at 5%, or sometimes you also check whether it's significant at 10%. And the stronger the statistical significance, the lower the p-value. It all seems fine for now. What is the deal with multiple testing and the family-wise error rate? Well, the reason for this being very important is that when you test for the same thing multiple times, you can expect roughly 5 out of your 100 tests being significant at 5% due to random chance alone. After all, these p-values come from statistical distributions and they are calculated using well-known confidence intervals. So if you made 100 tests, tested 100 hypotheses and had 5 results significant at 5% or 1 result significant at 1%, that's exactly what you would have expected if there has been no effect in the first place. And that is very important in econometrics and financial econometrics to be even more specific. Over the past decades, there has been loads of studies that tried to investigate profitability of various strategies, profitability of various factors to find persistence or other patterns in financial returns. And it turns out that many of these are spurious and due to data mining. When you try and find different variants of the same effect in your data, for example, is the moving average with the period of five profitable? No, maybe a moving average with a period of six is profitable. And if you check 20 of such periods, there is just statistical likelihood that one of these 20 results would be significant at 5%. So there are statistical techniques that are designed to combat such uh, spurious results arising from multiple testing. And these are mainly developed to help researchers figure out which results are robust to multiple testing and which can be results of data mining. In our example, we have tested one hypothesis and we don't really need to know what this hypothesis is 20 times and we had 20 p-values. We could have applied the same test to 20 different sum samples, we could have tested 20 different variants of the same hypothesis on, 20, um, on the same sample, but it doesn't really matter. What we want to know is whether these p-values are actually significant, whether we can reject the null hypothesis for some of these executions of the test. And if we take these p-values without any reservations, then we can simply count if how many of those p-values pass the conventional thresholds. For example, we can count if uh, these p-values are less than 1%, so the 1% threshold, significant 1%. We see that one of these results is indeed significant 1%, very significant seemingly, that is result number 5. And we can also check whether some of these are also significant at 5%. And at 5%, we have got three additional significant results, namely result number 6, result number 17, and result number 19. And now we will apply four most commonly used techniques to control for multiple testing and family-wise error rate. The simplest and the oldest one is the so-called Bonferroni adjustment, named after the statistician who proposed it. It is basically the adjustment of the p-values upward by the factor of the number of hypotheses you have tested. 
as again, this is very logical. If you test 100 hypotheses, one of them would be significant at 1% as a result of random chance alone. However, if we multiply some high p-value by a very high number, we can get a p-value that's higher than 1, and it wouldn't be interpretable. So to keep these results interpretable as uh, p-values, we just return the minimum of this product and 1. So let's apply the Bonferroni adjustment formula. So let's just uh, figure out that we need to input the minimum function of the product of the original p-value and the number of hypotheses we have tested and 1. And if we apply it for all 20 hypotheses we have tested, we see that none of them are actually significant at 5%. And if we drag this across, we can verify that using our COUNTIF function. The most significant p-value we have got is the one for hypothesis 5. It is still significant at 10%, but it isn't small enough to be significant at 5%. However, there are criticisms addressed at the Bonferroni adjustment that it is too penalizing, that it reduces the number of um, seemingly significant results by too much, that it inflates the p-values by so very much. And to address that, there is also the home adjustment, which is a modification of the Bonferroni adjustment, where you multiply your p-values not by the number of hypotheses always, but by the rank of these p-values in the decrease in order. That would mean that you multiply the smallest p-values you've got by the large numbers that are very close to the number of total hypotheses you are testing, but this factor would decrease as you move throughout the p-values towards the least significant p-values. That also makes sure that we do not have a very high inflation of p-values somewhere over here, but we also can input this minimum function over here so that the results are capped at 100%. So let's calculate the home adjustment, and to do that we need to first calculate the ranks of our p-values. And we can do it quite easily using the rank function, inputting first our original p-value, then specifying the array that we care about, the array of all p-values that we need to lock row-wise, and we need to specify that we need them in descending order, so input 0 over here. And then we can drag it all the way down across our 20 tested hypotheses and perform the home adjustment by figuring out the minimum of our p-value times rank and 1. And here we see that our hypothesis 5 p-value is still being multiplied by 20, but the second smallest p-value, the second most significant result, at least seemingly, hypothesis 6, is being multiplied by 90 instead of 20, and so on and so forth, with the largest p-value over here at 95% being left as it is, multiplied by 1. Home adjustment is less penalizing than the Bonferroni adjustment, and is generally preferred by econometricians, but both Bonferroni and Home have this unfortunate property that they can inflate p-values above 1. That's not necessarily a major problem, but there is a very neat and beautiful adjustment that avoids that, and that's the Chow-Denning adjustment. That's a variant of Bonferroni, but it treats p-values as probabilities, and it cannot return values in excess of 1. And that has been developed actually to address multiple testing concerns in variance ratio tests, and I have got a video on this particular application of Chow-Denning adjustment over here, if you are interested in that. But Chow-Denning can be performed to any sets of p-values from multiple hypothesis testing. And that involves subtracting from 1 the 1 minus p-value raised to the power of the number of hypotheses. And let's see what it returns. So we should input 1 minus 1 minus the original p-value to the power of the number of original hypotheses. And here we can enforce this throughout the whole hypothesis and see that the results are very similar, albeit slightly smaller in terms of the uh, resulting p-values because of this uh, adjustment being not arithmetic but rather geometric as we raise to the power instead of multiplying. And we can make sure that when we adjust, no matter how, no matter whether we use Bonferroni, Home, or Chow-Denning, we still fail to record any robustly significant results when we account for multiple testing and the family-wise error rate. However, all three of the tests we have investigated so far, all three of these adjustments, suffer from the fact that they perform well 
when the hypotheses we test are independent, but they can fall short when the hypotheses we're investigating are dependent of each other. For example, we might want to ask if is at least one of our tests statistically significant. And for that, those three hypothesis testing mechanisms are not uh, perfectly applicable. Here we can use another criterion, and that's the last one we're going to investigate today, which differs slightly in terms of its logic and in terms of its mathematics. That is the Wilson harmonic mean p-value that seeks to investigate whether at least one of the hypotheses you have tested out of 20 in our case um, return a significant result, whether any of the null hypotheses needs to be rejected. And here we need to calculate the harmonic mean of all p-values in our sample of hypotheses. And we can calculate it either using the definition of the harmonic mean directly, so the number of observations, the number of hypotheses, over the sum of the reciprocals of the p-values. And we've got 5.27% as our harmonic mean p-value, meaning that is insignificant as 5%, meaning that 5% we have got no reason to reject any of the null hypotheses, so we've got no significant results whatsoever in our selection of 20 p-values. Or, to make it a little bit shorter and simpler in terms of calculations, we could use a built-in Excel har mean function, which does exactly the same thing and calculates the harmonic mean uh, across the sample. And we get the same result, 5.27%, meaning that while there are reasons to reject some null hypotheses at 10%, at 5%, none of them are significant. And that's all there is for Bonferroni, Holm, Chowdenning, and Wilson procedures for multiple testing and family-wise error rate adjustments, and applications to testing whether any of multiple testing hypotheses needs to be rejected in favor of the alternative ones. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I make it to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.